Good morning. It's, it's nice to meet you. Uh, this is Senator uh, Patty Labucane Benson. I'm Tammy Denmi. I'm the Indigenous Education Lead for the London District Catholic School Board. And I'm very honored today to be able to bring some questions uh, to the Senator about her graphic novel, The Outside Circle. So the, the first question we have today is, what was your inspiration behind The Outside Circle? Okay, thank you for that. I'm just gonna start by saying that um, I'm a Métis Ukrainian. I grew up on Treaty 6 territory. I wanna acknowledge that I'm on Treaty 6 territory today and that we're all treaty people. And um, I, I am just so honored to be here. Uh, it didn't work out the last time when, when uh, Kelly and I were supposed to be on together. For some reason I couldn't log in, but that's okay. Um, I'm really happy to meet you, Tammy, and um, excited to talk about the outside circle. So your question is, what was the inspiration for yeah. the, the graphic novel? Well, it's kind of a nerdy answer. I, um, I did my PhD. It actually took me about 10 years to do it because I was working full time. I was a full time mom um, and I was uh, trying to get this PhD done. And in 2009, I finished. And when I finished my defense and I had passed and everything was done, my committee said, you should really publish your, your PhD. And in my inside head, I was thinking, I would rather shoot myself in the kneecap than write another academic text right now. I mean, I didn't say it because that would have been disrespectful, but I was definitely thinking that. And so I went home and I thought about it and I was having coffee with my husband and said, you know what, I want to write a graphic novel based on my dissertation. And he kind of rolled his eyes like, okay, yeah, whatever. And I had a meeting with my advisor and said, I'd really like to do this as a graphic novel. And she kind of rolled her eyes because in 2009, it wasn't common. It's more common now to write historical fiction as graphic novel, but then it was, it was really uncommon. So I thought, well, I don't care. I really want to do this. So I called Kelly. I asked him if he was interested and we started this two year process of changing what looked like a very academic um, piece of writing into a story about a family that was experiencing, um, you know, historic trauma, poverty, uh, hopelessness, helplessness, and powerlessness living in the inner city of Edmonton, and what healing might look like for these, these people based on what I learned in my PhD. So that was the, that was why I did what I did. Quite the story, but why a graphic novel? Why not just a piece of fiction? Well, I have this little junior high school boy living inside of me and I love comic books. Like I really love comic books. I, you know, I could talk about, you know, DC versus Marvel. I love, um, I love Neil Gaiman and the work that he's done. Like I have been a fan of the graphic novel and the comic book for a long time. So uh, the other reason a graphic novel was appealing is because it would hit a much wider audience. So if you think about you know, out of 100 people in Canada who might read a dissertation, less than one, who might read, you know, a fictional novel, you know, maybe 25%, but who might read a graphic novel that was more geared towards an older, you know, an older um, youth population or even a young adult population, I thought maybe more people would read it. And then on top of that, one of the nice outcomes of that is that, um, I've had experiences of doing school presentations where young boys, you know, ten, grade 10, who were defined by their teachers as resistant readers, combed through the graphic novel, read it twice, and had the most challenging questions I've ever fielded about the novel came from those boys because they knew those characters, they have lived those characters, and they wanted, you know, they wanted some answers. So I think, wow. um, yeah, that was, that was the best day, you know, for telling you spent 26 years teaching and a lot of it teaching English. That's a dream for an English teacher to hear that, that, that it would speak to those boys. So that's, that's fantastic. Mm, it was, it was, it was a very good day. It was a and very do, good day. Do you have a sense of your readership? Did you, of how big the graphic novel has gone across the country? Oh, you know what, Tammy, it's actually hilarious because I get tweeted out a lot about the outside circle. Even today, six years after publication, I still get tweets. You know, uh, Coach JB says, this read like an action novel. This was great. You know, I got some of the, like, I'm, like, I'm glad 
Coach JB read my graphic novel. Like who would have thought, right? I get tweeted at by a lot of teachers and I'm always so grateful for teachers to teach the outside circle. I, when I wrote it, I could see it as both a textbook and something anybody could pick up, but there is, there's a textbook quality to it with, you know, putting in some nerdy researchy bits and some statistic bits. And then the splash pages that are there, the idea of those bigger pieces of art were to really provoke thought and um, to explore and unpack those pieces of art as well. So there, uh, there's something in it for everyone. And I'm all, oh, and actually, you know, this is a funny story. In Calgary, I was doing, um, you know, a word fest. You do book festivals in, in a small book tour when I started. And I was in Calgary doing an Indigenous spotlight. It was mostly senior citizens in the audience. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, like, I don't know. I don't know if this is my group, but you know, it was a fun time on stage and we, we were very, the, the host was fantastic, got us talking to the audience and, and my book sold out at the tables outside the doors and more than one senior citizen who was non-Indigenous, you know, came to me and said, I can't, you're making me buy a graphic novel. And it was like, I was, I was forcing them to do something that they would otherwise not want to do. And I thought, this is amazing. You know, if, if these people are buying my book and on the other hand, I have grade 10 indigenous boys uh, reading this as well, there's some magic, there's some magic going on in this graphic novel Absolutely. that I can't even take credit for, you know, between Kelly and I and the creator and the four person bear spirit, something happened in there. And we were able to put something out, a, 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 a graphic novel out that people were connecting to. And I would say kind of maybe on an emotional and spiritual level that helps bring that information deeper into somebody's heart, you know, and to, and to make it kind of sit and land and provoke thought and reflection on it. So I'm just eternally grateful that House of Anansi picked up the graphic novel and published it and put some, put some um, resources behind it too to make sure it got out there. Yeah, sitting and landing is something that again every other every teacher wants. And and hearing Kelly's story in the book talk was really incredible because you are an Indigenous person and he's not. And yeah. the way he came to it and he went on the proper journey and he didn't take any shortcuts was incredible. Mm -hmm. there, you know, I have been asked why didn't you choose an Indigenous uh, illustrator? And I mean. I already had a working relationship with Kelly and this graphic novel to do the work that we did together had to be grounded in relationship. And it, I, I, it was, there were difficult conversations that had to be had all the way through. And so um, I chose to go with somebody that I had a good working relationship with that I could be really honest with. I felt that Kelly could be honest with me. I felt that we could sit side by side and we had to at times when we were doing, you know, edit number two and then edit number three and that he was comfortable with um with the exploration of this story that was so you know it took 20 years 20 years of my work in making and um and not only that i agree he did all of his own work he did his own spiritual work he did his own unpacking around his own colonial bias in that process to me that's kind of a reconciliation story yes. right and many of the people who are reading your graphic novel will be non-Indigenous. And so they can see a path for themselves by mm. listening to, to his story. So I think that was really powerful. Do you have, do you have a favorite um, image or page from, from the graphic novel? Well, that's a hard one because uh, I have favorites for different reasons. So if, uh, if you ask me, what is the favorite piece of art? It's the splash page of Pete in the sweat lodge. Because I think Kelly, like I still get goosebumps. I just got goosebumps thinking about it. I think Kelly brought it so hard on that because I, I explained to him what was going on. Like, this is what's happening with Pete. Like he's having a massive existential identity crisis with grief and loss. Like the things that are happening to Pete in that lodge at that moment are profoundly human. And we need to bring that anguish, you know, that he's feeling in his heart to the page. And, and I see I'm getting tears. When, when, he, when I saw the, the art, when Kelly brought it to me, I, I just, I sat back and I took a deep breath and I thought, okay, that was the one. That's exactly 
it hit me so hard. Even though I'm the one that told Kelly to, to draw it, it hit me so hard. Um, you know, when I was preparing for my first interview, and I was lucky, it was with Sheila Rogers. I don't know if you listen oh, to the yeah. next chapter. Huge okay. fan, huge mm-hmm. fan. Well, and she's a very, a very close friend of mine. And so uh, I was getting ready for my interview with her. And I realized I had to read the book front to back a couple of times because I was still crying every time we got to the uh, Uncle Ray's story, the, the image of when um, all of those children were taken from his mom and she's watching them leave on the bus. I still cry every time. And I actually had to get myself ready for that, um, that interview so that I wouldn't be so <laughs> overcome with emotion that I couldn't continue the interview. And so um, that's one of my favorite Uncle Ray's pages, that circular story that, that then winds up with his story of, um, of being apprehended and abandoned. Uh, that is some, and actually it's a funny story because when I was trying to explain it to Kelly and Greg, who was helping produce it, uh, Greg was like, what are you even talking about? So anybody who's familiar with Neil Gaiman's work, he is a master of showing a thousand years of history in one open page moving from left to right. And I said, this is what I want. And so I just took a picture of it and sent it to both of them. And Kelly said, oh, just, you know, one of the most profound pieces of art ever published in a graphic novel. That's what you want. I said, you can do it, Kelly. I knew you, I knew you could. <laughs> and Greg just emailed us back and said, you guys, you've lost me. I don't even know what you're talking about at this point, you know. But, um, but yeah, so Kelly really brought it on those on those images as well. That's not easy to show an intergenerational story of trauma in two pages. To to me, Kelly said that one of his favorite images was the tattoo on the arm, which shows all the legislation over a a couple of hundred years, a few hundred years in Canada for Indigenous people. And for me too, that's the page that struck me because I'm always trying to teach this lesson to grade seven, eight, 10, 11, 12 students. And here he, he captured it. He did. An incredible image. So I, and I mean, this is another good example. I said, I want him to be getting his tattoo and there's blood dripping down. And in the rivers of blood, there's legislation in it. And it, you know, uh, this is why I needed to work with Kelly because never once did he roll his eyes. Never once did he say, I don't know that'll work, Patty. You know, it was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to try and do that, you know? So I'm not meaning to put you on the spot, but when you teach it, what do you think the symbol of that, that tattooed arm is? To me, it shows, it's like intergenerational trauma in a snapshot. It's explaining why things are the way they are in a snapshot with all the pain oozing out in the blood. Oh, that's That's awesome. That's what I see. Yep, that's awesome. I'll give you another interpretation. Interpretation. I always ask teachers what they do with it because I want to hear their perspective. Hey, um, to me, that that gang tattoo is a metaphor of colonization. That gang tattoos are not symbols of gangs; they're actually symbols of colonization, of dispossession, of hopelessness, helplessness, and powerlessness, of poverty, and inner city uh, indigenous young men who are gang affiliated are literally bleeding colonial pain. And so I, um, I, 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 that's one of my favorite pages too, but it's usually everybody's favorite page. And I know that you could take that, that picture and teach it for a week yeah, and dissect every single piece of those colonial laws and, and, and query as to why that contributes to um, historical trauma. It, it's it's incredibly powerful. Thank you. Um, so let me see from some of our, there's so many great questions. Um, why would you say, and this is hard for some people to understand, it's essential to develop a sense of cultural identity for people? Well, so in the process of doing my PhD and then some of the research that I worked on afterwards, uh, I started looking at what I refer to as the four dimensions of historic trauma. And so looking at, okay, if all of this happened in the past, if all of these colonial laws were passed, what has that created in our 
thoughts and behaviors as Indigenous people. Now, I'm not talking about every Indigenous person. You know, many, many people have done healing. Their families have done healing. Uh, they're not dealing, they're not carrying this burden of historic trauma or maybe not as heavily anymore. But for the, the people who are still carrying this burden of historic trauma, there's what I would say four dimensions. So uh, the first three around a colonized um, psyche, and this goes right to your question, is uh, many uh, people that we worked with when I worked at Native Counseling Services of Alberta, uh, clients, families had internalized those colonial assumptions, negative assumptions about Indigenous people. You know, they feared their own culture. They believed that it was evil or heathen, that they shouldn't participate. Um, it's this profound lack of comfort with our own Indigenous identity, and yet no real connection to Canadian identity either. So being this intergenerational um, passing of identity confusion. And so one of the most critical pieces of healing is to repair that internal conflict of not being comfortable with Indigenous identity. And so you refer to as cultural identity. Um, I agree for the, the work that we did at Native Counseling Services of Alberta and as I was one of the leads of the In Search of Your Warrior program in my work there, we know that we need to number one, dispel fear about our own culture. All of those colonial ideas about it being evil and heathen and, and you know, devil worshiping and all that's, all of those ugly, ideas about our own spirituality have to be unpacked, have to be um, talked about gently and carefully, and we need to dispel the fear. And then on top of that, whether an individual decides to follow, you know, in our neck of the woods, a sweat lodge and, and you know, traditional path, or whether they're very comfortable being Christian, or maybe they're atheist or whatever, that's a, that's a personal choice and good on them but it should be an informed choice. It shouldn't be an idea that's based in fear of our own culture or, or like thinking that somehow it's inferior to Western culture. You know, an informed decision, we, you know, we always say at NCSA, pray to who you wanna pray or don't pray at all, but do it in a way that doesn't, that doesn't dismiss or discredit indigenous culture. So I think that that piece is incredibly important. Who, who am I? Like, who am I as a, as a Métis, Ukrainian, French? Like, I, I've got a lot of stuff going on in my history. Uh, who am I? And, and what does that mean to me? And I need to call all of those pieces of my identity to myself in a good way if I'm going to move around in this world successfully. Yeah. And, and I can tell you from working with students that that is what I have found, too. Um, absolutely. People have to know who they are and love who they are. And love who they are. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's see what else. So there's a, a longish question. As seen in the novel, Pete experiences a lot of violence and intergenerational trauma. Based on your knowledge, what are some of the negative consequences of the intergenerational trauma experienced by Indigenous people today? Okay, so I already talked about a colonized psyche. So that's number one. Uh, number two is a loss of uh, our traditional legal systems. So what I mean by that is, um, as children, we learn right from wrong, our very first legal system in our families. And for Cree people, for, you know, around here, there's a lot of Cree people, that was based in the legal system known as Wahotuin. It's about our relationships and the rules that guide our relationships. One of the most devastating things that happened in colonization is our legal systems were denigrated. Um, there was an assumption of the settlers that came here that we didn't have legal systems, that we were he that we were savages, you know, primitive. There was no form of law that existed, which is absolutely not the truth. And so children in this process, they were, you know, the apprehension of children into residential schools meant that they didn't have an opportunity to learn you know, they're Wahoto and they didn't learn the rules that guided relationships at the feet of their grandparents and in ceremony, which is the primary educational vehicle. They didn't get an opportunity to learn that. But at residential schools, it was usually and often a shame-based, very harsh environment that they didn't really learn healthy relationships and rules that guide relationships there either. 
and so one of the one of the outcomes is that we have um, children that grow up with this lawlessness, this this lack of of an environment where they they know right from wrong. You know what I mean? They're learning about good, healthy relationships, and those those colonized, damaged relationships can get passed on intergenerationally. And that brings us to like the third thing about kinship, the damage of kinship relationships. We have in some families, in some communities, a higher prevalence of domestic violence, broadly defined. That's a colonial construct that has everything to do with the residential school phenomenon that went on for generations and generations and generations of people. And one of the very, very um, cornerstones of our healing is not only healing my relationship with myself, but then taking what I've learned and healing the relationships with my family. And that's easier said than done. Like that's an intergenerational undertaking, but it is part of healing. And then the fourth dimension of historic trauma is um, the loss of the ability to self-determine. You know, self-determination as nations is something that we're still trying to reclaim. We're still trying to make that happen at a, at a federal level. That's one piece. But also the, um, you know, residential schools did not teach children autonomy at all. Most First Nation practice was to, for children to learn in a very natural way. Children were, were um, autonomy was encouraged as a method of learning. Whereas at residential schools, kids were not allowed to make any decision for themselves. It was completely regimented. There's even schools that would um, plan, uh, like as, as teenagers were leaving, they would pick people to get married. So they would, you know, arrange marriages and tell people what vocation. So you'd be a house cleaner, you'd be whatever. Like there was, there was no autonomy built into that system. And so one of the cornerstones of healing is self-determination for me as, a, as, an, as an individual, you know, if it shall be, it's up to me. It's up to me to make good decisions for myself and my family. It's important for families to be able to self-determine as the family unit for, you know, to be able to chart their own course. And it's important for nations to be able to self-determine. So this, so that healing is kind of, at the end of the book, there's a spiral, you know, the individual, the family, the nation, the natural world and the spirit world. Our relationships up and down that spiral are important. And the capacity for everyone to respectfully self-determine is part of that as well. That was wow. a long answer. That's an incredible teaching though, to, th to think of those four parameters. That's an incredible teaching. I once heard Senator Sinclair say the actual worst thing about residential schools might've been that it kept people from the good life. And I know yeah. there's an Anishinaabe word for it, mm -hmm. um, but that's actually, you know, possibly the worst damage, which is what you're talking about here. You bet. In Cree, it's Pamatsuin. In Anishinaabe, it's Pamatsuin. They use there we go. <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, so another question that we have here is, from your experience, what is the most important aspect of healing, especially when it comes to Indigenous youth with historical trauma? Hmm. Well, I would say that that those four we have to address those four dimensions. I I, I do I don't think we can focus only on uh, identity and not self determination. I don't think we can, you know, only focus on family relationships, but not on the reclamation of of a, uh, a system of law that helps us to relate to each other in respectful, kind, uh, and humble ways. I I think that all of that has to be embedded in any healing program. And I will say that I think young people need historic trauma healing programs as much as adults. I think young people can handle it. Um, we've done some work in the uh, Edmonton Young Offender Center with Indigenous youth, and they, you know, in, in a version of In Search of Your Warrior, and they were very successful. I think we can go even deeper. I think young people are able to uh, embrace and understand healing much faster than adults. You know, when, when a young person takes something and you can see it click in their head and they change in a, in a snap of a finger, they're able to actualize healing and change faster. As adults, we have to sit in a circle and we have to talk and talk and, you know, it, like we take a long time to unpack our stuff. But I think young people, if we give them the tools, if we, if we invest the resources, time and money into serious historic trauma healing, 
they'll they'll change their communities. I, well, I believe in them fully. Well, that, that's a really interesting and good for me to hear because another question that has come up and that I think about a lot as the Indigenous lead in the board is what, what can I say to a teacher who's hesitant or to the board who's hesitant to approve the use of uh, the outside circle in the classroom because of the traumatic content in it? Um, well, okay, uh, this is what I think. I think um, young people have a lot less problem with it than adults. I think adults have a hard time with it because, you know, um, the, uh, an elder that I worked with, actually a group of elders, we were doing a teaching circle and um, they were talking about colonization. They were talking about how it affected them, their families and their communities. We were in the circle and I was there with a video production team and um, they could see on my face and other people's faces just how angry we were getting. Like these are hard stories to hear and our body language was changing. And at one point, one of the elders, he put his hand up and he said, you need to stop. And he said, at this point in time in history, we have no time for blame, shame, and guilt. He didn't say no anger. I mean, anger is that emotion given to us by the creator to get us to stand up and do something about what's making us angry. So that's a motivating uh, emotion. But blame, shame, and guilt have no place in healing. As a matter of fact, all they do is cause people, as soon as they feel guilty, to get into a defensive posture and this cognitive dissonance takes over this defensiveness that no, that can't be true. I never learned that as a child. This is, you know, this is an exaggeration. This is a biased form of history. And this cogniz cogniz <laughs> cognitive dissonance, it takes over. Yeah. And once we have people backed up into a corner, defending their position, there's no discussion. There's nothing that we can do until we rectify that situation. And so what I would say in this case, I understand how these stories bring up feelings of guilt or shame for non-Indigenous people. Because the underlying story, underlying message here is that um, what Canada is and what Canadians have, have really been possible because of what happened to Indigenous people. You know, moving Indigenous people off the land making sure they were in small tracts of land, apprehending kids into residential school, and many, many other laws. This was all part of the colonizing journey. And so I understand wh why non-Indigenous people feel, have feelings about that. And I, um, I firmly believe reconciliation is uncomfortable. It should be uncomfortable. If, you're com if, if we feel comfortable, we are not pushing ourselves farther. But we, all, we always, on both sides of this equation, have to understand blame, shame, and guilt will never work. I'm not interested in those emotions. I don't want to feel them. I don't want other people to feel them. I want us to feel like um, this is a Canadian narrative. This is something we can all work on together. And the past is the past. We have to acknowledge it. We have to embrace it. We need a common understanding of it. But then let's move forward and let's, let's build real relationships. Let's make sure Indigenous people fully participate in the Canadian fabric. Let's make sure that Indigenous people have voices at tables, feel in control of their own destiny like everybody else wants to feel. And we, we will be able to do this reconciliation project. We can get this done. It'll take generations, but it's, it's just moving away from this defensiveness, this feeling of guilt and shame. It's got no place in this. I've been told that strongly on many occasions and regularly by the Indigenous cultural advisor in my board, who is an Oneida man, who we wouldn't make a step without him in our in our board. Wise, um, wise elders, eh? What oh, would we do without them? He says he's not an elder yet, but. Oh. <laughs> hey, fair enough. I have <laughs> I, I have uh, nieces and uh, like I like to be called auntie and not you know grandma, so yeah. I get it. <laughs> but I think that. What teachers are more worried about, even than, although what you're talking about is valid and needs to be addressed about the blame, shame, and guilt, is more like, let's say, a student who has experienced similar things that have happened to the characters in the outside circle. So, for example, their, you know, their mom was a drug user, their brother was in a gang, and the potential for that to trigger something in them in a classroom setting. Yeah. So 
what I would say about that is this can't be the very first book that could trigger a member like a, a, of a classroom, a, a student. There are so many books out there that could be triggering because we have lots of students who not just indigenous students who come from paths of trauma. You know, we have immigrant students, we have non-indigenous students who've grown up in poverty. Family violence isn't owned by indigenous people. Family violence happens across all um, socioeconomic um, classes in Canada. So I think, I think that teachers already have the skills. I don't mean to diminish it. They are, it, this has to be approached not as an indigenous problem. It's a human condition of trauma. And how do we work with students who have experienced trauma? And we can expect that more than half of our students have experienced some form of trauma and could be triggered. You can't tell me that teaching to kill a mockingbird isn't triggering for a whole group of people. Yes, so absolutely. Why, you know, and I think, again, this comes down to teachers not feeling like they understand history enough, feeling like they have all the skills and the training for this particular issue. Yeah. But, uh, but they know how to treat children like human beings. They know how to love students. At the end of the day, if we approach it from a place of love and understanding and kindness, of course they can support Indigenous students. Yeah, which you're, you are right. Teachers do. They are absolute pros at. They, they love their students. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more, maybe. Okay. Um, in some ways, you've answered lots of these questions because I talk a lot <laughs> which is fantastic we don't we want to hear from you um tell my husband that I'll give you his email address <laughs> okay here's one do you fear that the outside circle might just reinforce stereotypes that people have of indigenous people who live in Canada well if their stereotype of indigenous people is that they can heal and they can take control of their lives and they can make a better life for themselves hell yeah yeah, I do. Bingo. I think we can. <laughs> you know, that well I, 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 I think that question is, um, is founded in somebody who has a lot of stereotypes, not I'm not being judgmental about it. But um, this is a story of healing. And if we don't talk about the trauma, and we don't talk about the trauma based behavior, then, um, you know, and that really is in the first third or less quarter of the book that we see Pete in his gang life and we see his brother and and his mom and all of the things that are happening in their life but very quickly the book switches and starts talking about healing the majority of the book is about healing and about um and about uh the trauma that was inflicted on indigenous people and they had no control over so I guess that that question hurts my heart a little bit but i completely understand why it's being asked and i would i would direct that questioner to the last part of the book and let's let's say that's the stereotype indigenous people can heal can move on even a guy in jail gang affiliated full of tattoos who's committed a manslaughter can heal and be a good man and be part of our society in a kind and gentle way that's the stereotype i want to believe in and it is the strongest message of the book. Absolutely. Awesome. So fair enough. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that we've taken up an hour of your time, which is what you promised us. And I want to say that I really, really thank you. And I'm honored to have met you. And I'd love to hear more about the Senate too someday from you and what that's like. Uh, I had an opportunity once with a teacher's group to do an, a parliamentary institute and I got to go into the Senate and meet the senators. Awesome. And that was pretty, I, pretty cool. I got to do the Senate part of that uh, just once because I've only been in the Senate two years and it was fun. It was fun to meet all those teachers and that you, you guys sit in our desks and you get to be the senators. That's kind of funny. <laughs> it's you fantastic. Know, it really is. And I'm not sure if teachers know about this. So the teachers who are watching, um, there's a thing called Cengage, which there's a whole communications um, department at the Senate where if you contact them, they will get senators in your area to come and give presentations. And so the, the whole idea of Cengage is to get us engaged in communities and primarily in schools. So um, there's, a, there's an avenue to talk Senate with senators in schools. Okay, fantastic. I'll message that out there for sure. Right on. All right, thank you so much for your time and have a great rest to your day. And is, is it cold out there in Edmonton? It's a beautiful day. It feels like spring. 
you Same know what tammy here. it was an honor to meet you thank you for doing this interview and um i love talking about the outside circle so it was the best start to the day i could have fantastic thank you so awesome. much take care